Good morning. Thank you for joining me at the end of this very special week as we've looked at the resurrection stories. In many ways, this is one of the most vital parts of the whole story. It's the last thing that Jesus said to his disciples. Now, if you study the Gospels, you'll find each one gives you rather a different view. Uh, that's not unusual if four of us sat down and wrote today. I'm sure all four of us would say the same thing from a different angle. And Mark says it like this. Turn with me to Mark 16 and verse 15. Now remember, if you're driving into Philly right now, don't open your scriptures. I'll read to you. It's safer that way. If, on the other hand, you're sitting up in bed, just get your Bible and look at Mark 16, verse 15. And it says, Jesus said to the disciples, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Now there's so much here to learn, and it's so simple and straightforward. Somehow, much of the church of Jesus Christ has put it on one side. I've said before, as I understand it, there's a threefold ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us. This thought expands that a little bit. First and foremost is always the same thing. We are to preach the gospel. But then there's something else here that you have to see. Did you notice that right at the end, Mark says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by signs that accompanied it, the word. Now, this is very important. I believe what's happened in our generation is very simple. We simply don't have the signs and wonders following the preaching of the word. We don't expect them, we don't get them, and we don't touch the world. I believe a lot of our young people have pulled out of the church because they don't see the action. They don't see the action of the New Testament. They don't see the action in the church today. I believe with all my heart the Lord our God wants to still do those signs and wonders that he did when Jesus was on earth. Now, what has gone wrong? Well, I think sometimes we've got so involved in our church, our doctrines, our liturgies, that we've missed doing what Jesus says. So let's go back and see what he does say. He says, go into all the world. The mission field for the church is the whole world. When people say, why do you go overseas? We go overseas because we are told to go overseas. We were told to go to all people. What were we to preach? We are to preach the good news to all creation. The good news being very simple. That Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, became man, lived a perfect life, and died for the sins of mankind. We can go on with a step further there and say, when we take Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we are freed from sin, and we are freed from death, and therefore we have everlasting life. That is step number one. And remember this, whether you look at the preaching of Jesus and his life and ministry, or whether you look at the New Testament church or the early church, this was always the same. First and foremost was the preaching of the gospel. Now, once we miss that from the pulpits of our land, we miss the rest. You have to have that first. Jesus says, go and preach the gospel. Then he says in verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, be sure of this. The reason that a person is saved is because they believe. And it is not because they are baptized. They are baptized once they believe to show that they believe. But the essential part is the belief. The second thing is, remember that belief is not some head knowledge. It's not that because I believe certain facts 
that I am saved, but because I believe certain facts, my lifestyle changes. I become that new person in Jesus Christ. Now that's a very different thing. I believe and therefore I live. Now if you say you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and your lifestyle has not changed, I think you have to question whether you really do believe. I think you have to question if that whole thing is real in your life. Now if you know of Jesus Christ and you hear the preaching of the gospel and you do not believe, you're condemned by your lack of belief. And it is very vital to see that it is each individual who makes the decision. And therefore, if you choose not to believe, and you have every right to do that, you condemn yourself for not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, when God has said this is His Son. You're really denying what God has said. Now, from that, something else comes. Mark says, signs follow. And Jesus says it. Verse 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they'll drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Five different signs that Jesus gives. Now, before we get into the actual signs, let me just take one sideline. Every so often you find a group of believers who go a little wacky and start trying to take this out of context. You don't now go out and buy poison and drink it to prove that Mark 16 is correct. You don't go down to the pet store and ask if you can buy a poisonous snake to see if it will bite you and if the Lord will protect you. Let's come at it at a totally different angle. I mentioned earlier in the week the marvelous little book, Like a Mighty Wind by Mel Tari. Now Mel Tari tells us in there that in Indonesia, when the power of the Spirit came down on their Presbyterian church, they went out in teams to preach the gospel. When they went to preach the gospel, these things happened. Do you understand that? It wasn't when they went to the supermarket. It wasn't when they were going to visit auntie for Sunday dinner. It was when they went out to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything we read in Mark 16 followed. All those things happened. One day they went into a village, and as they went across the bridge of the little river into the village, the witch doctor had set up hex signs and other things all on the bridge. And that was to stop the team going in. The leader of the team kicked that into the river. Then they got into the village, and the villagers greeted them, met them, and gave them all a cup of tea. And they sat down and they drank with the villagers. The villagers sat and watched them as they had never been watched in their lives. They couldn't make out what was going on. And after about ten minutes, they said, Are you feeling well? They said, Great. They said, We have put poison in that tea that would kill anyone within 10 minutes. Did you hear what Jesus said? Did you understand that? You will drink poison and it will not hurt you. Why not? Because you have the protection of the Lord. And they experienced that. One of their team was bitten by a deadly snake. Nothing happened because the protection of the Lord was there. Our God can do anything. He can nullify anything. And he did in their experience. There's something else. It says, they will speak in new tongues. Now you may interpret this a couple of ways. I believe this involves the speaking in tongues. I believe that when we believe the gospel, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we surrender our lives to the Lord, he gives us a heavenly language. We say, what for? I think simply to communicate with him. A direct hotline to heaven. And I'll take that any day. That is invaluable. We could go into that subject much more widely, but just leave it there. He also says, they, in my name they will drive out demons. In my name they'll drive out demons. Throughout the book of Mark, we've looked at this a number of times, and friends have called me up, listeners, to say about this demonic situation. Know this, there are many demonic forces at work in our generation. It wasn't very long ago, in March, one evening, I prayed in four different situations for different people, and every one was demonic. 
That's how active the enemy is. I only prayed with four people or four groups of people and every situation was demonic without a shadow of doubt. I'm not getting hysterical. I'm not making something up. Demonic forces were involved. Satan is extremely active and I think you should know that. The second thing is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you should have no fear of that because you know the power that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than the power that there is in the world. And you have the victory in Jesus Christ. Now, remember, bind up Satan, bind up demonic forces in the authority of Jesus. But do not cast them out unless you understand what you're doing or the Holy Spirit makes it very clear that you should. It is a very dangerous area to get into unless you understand it. I know we have the forces. I know we have the strength in Christ. But it's not an easy area. There's something else Jesus says. He said, they will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Now you say, just a minute Richard, I know someone who has prayed for with a laying on of hands and they were not healed. Yes, so do I. I also know many people who had the laying on of hands and they were healed. And as I've said to you before, in divine healing there is no formula or equation that explains the whole situation. I know our God wants us well. I know our God can do it. I don't always know why he doesn't. But I rest in what he said. He has told me to lay hands on the sick. The recovery is his problem. I do this in faith believing and I have seen many, many miracles. And there have been times when I've been absolutely stunned that someone hasn't been healed. But that's God's problem. And what I want them to do is to find the Lord our God in his fullness and let God work in that life. That's an authority that I believe we have as the disciples of Jesus Christ to pray for those who are not well. I don't think we tell them the Lord's going to heal them. We tell them that the Lord can heal them. And I think there are occasions when through our lips God says, I've healed you. I've experienced that on occasions. God works. After that, Jesus was taken up from the disciples and then they started to preach the word after Pentecost and what happened? Signs and wonders followed. And friend, there's no greater need in our generation than to see the signs and wonders that follow the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ.